<clears throat> I do not know if this is actually working or not, um, but this is a trial. Um, as many of you know, we were... Um, so, <clears throat> wow. I do not know. Uh, this is just a trial. Sorry to bother you if you're doing something else, uh, but... Uh, our friend Richard Lund of Lundpick is uh, helping me out here. I was totally uh, bumfuzzled with OBS, uh, something like something broadcasting software, way too technical. He got me into Ecamm Live, and um, looks like we've already got a bunch of viewers. Uh, guys, if you've got questions, <laughs> Rob T07. How you doing? Um, I'm just trying out this Ecamm Live, and um, if you have any questions or anything, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. What I'm doing, though, is I'm setting this up so we'll have a much more efficient way of getting posts out there and getting a, a live event set up. Um, as you know, it's just been a toothache, and half of the live events just didn't happen because... Um, because I don't know the technology. Uh, Ali Torabi, it's working great. Fantastic. Thank you for the feedback, Ali. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, Rob T07 says, good. Hi, Doc. Rob, you were hot uh, the other night. Uh, you, were, uh, you were predicting all of the answers before I was able to ask the questions. Um, but again, what we're wanting to do here is... We, is um, Richard Lund of Lundpix um, has helped us get set up with uh, uh, Ecamm Live. I'm on a Mac system, so that uh, works a lot better for Mac system. We've done actually a lot of uh, work with the, um, with the Filipino team today as well. We uh, are really making some huge progress in terms of being able to get this message out efficiently um, and not to just guys like most of us who are a little bit sort of like uh, maybe biomedical nerds uh, were able to get John Tacho surprised to see you at this time please don't give up the soft tech approach with the handheld papers <laughs> of the videos you know what I, I let me see if I've got any handheld uh, I don't have it I've got some at the other end of the house and uh, just for that request I'm tempted to walk over there and get some uh, the you keep if you if you ask I will certainly get those handheld uh, papers out there. Um, again, we're very excited about a lot of the core uh, operational work, operational and uh, access marketing work that we're getting out there. It looks like from a from a CIMT access tour perspective. We're setting up a system where we'll have both secondary markets and uh, larger markets with, you know, secondary market being maybe being something like Sacramento or Lexington, where I live, and a primary market being something more like L.A., uh, Houston, and New York. So what we plan to do is uh, David, uh, David Mites, who's been, who's a nutritionist uh, and has been doing this for decades. Uh, David will go around, looks like he's going to take the secondary markets, um, and we may set up, he may do the, the primary markets as well, and if he does, we may set up David coming through a couple of weeks ahead of time with um, a CIMT tour, so you can get your CIMT. And then uh, David Wright, our new doc, uh, I, I introduced him on, well, I haven't really introduced him. Michelle Curley, hi, exciting progress. I can only hang out for a few minutes. Thanks for just making the comment, Michelle. It, it makes it really clear. Um, folks are hearing me. This new system is working. Uh, obviously, my uh, visuals are just as bad as they, <laughs> as they always are, but this is a major step forward. I was able to just click like that and get on uh, YouTube. So, um, oh, and now I have a feed over here, too, John Tucho. Minneapolis? How could we not make it to Minneapolis? I'll tell you what. I, 
I can't resist. I got a story about Minneapolis. The first time I went to Minneapolis in my life, I was like age, I'd say 40. And isn't Minneapolis where Mall of America or some super giant mall was? It was January. You can, <laughs> you can imagine what Minneapolis was like in January. Never, we did get out of the hotel room, but I never got out of the hotel room other than to um, to meet with our uh, our client and to uh, to go out to dinner. So, oh uh, wait a minute, it, we've been to Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, hope you make it. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we we will probably make it to Minneapolis for sure, um, probably for sure. Well, you know, sorry, but anyway. Uh, so what we I hope to do is start setting up a system where uh, David comes through with some basic nutritional information, some basic uh, information regarding IMT and uh, the whole story about inflammation. Then we will come through a, a few weeks later after you've had your IMT and uh, do more of a boot camp type of experience. So that's what we're looking to do. Um, keep going over to, actually, who was it that requested the, the shaky paper? I'm gonna go ahead and do another one with the shaky paper real quick. Uh, after I did it on Wednesday, we got a bunch more um, A bunch more entries, a lot of, let me see. There we go. Um, and John, given your uh, presence on the channel, I think you have probably already signed up. Here we go. Cardiorisk.us slash Ford. Uh, let me see if I can move that back. Uh How's that for some of those good old school uh, visuals? Cardiorisk.us.fork. And so what you can do is sign up to get us um, scheduled to bring the IMT. You lost 50 pounds. I bet your stats improved. You know what? You lose 50 pounds like that, John, and there's nothing any doctor anywhere can do that's going to match that. That's just... That, that is huge. You just saved probably 30 years of your, of your life. I grew up in New Orleans, so I've been a rough 42 years living here. I, I, I interned in New Orleans at the Big Free Charity. Um, anyway, uh, we, would be, we would love to meet you in Minneapolis. Um, and here's the other thing. So at the uh, Healthy Life Summit uh, 2 in Orlando back in the end of March, we got some, um, a, three quarters of the attendees were uh, YouTubers from this channel. And they gave us some strong feedback. They said, look, you know what? We don't really want to see quite as much of the business approach. We don't want to see the small business insurance or tax, uh, whatever. The dental stuff is interesting, oral systemic health. But we really suggest that you do sort of a salon type of activity. And that's what we're doing. November 8 and 9. Um, Simon Tro, Liverpool. Oh my goodness, I just saw that movie. Uh, the Beatles were always a big, big deal for me. And I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, with, uh, oh gosh, what's the guy's name? One of The star was the guy out of uh, the Indian movie and the other guy was uh, Ed Sheeran. It was a great movie. Now, what was I going to, uh, oh yeah, Louisville. Uh, November 8 and 9, we're going to do the first of our, uh, that kind of event. Let me see if I can figure out how to make that work. Louisville 8 and 9, November 8 and 9. If you've got a chance, look it up on uh, prevmedheartrisk.com. And uh, we've already had a bunch of people sign up, even before... Um, even before we uh, started marketing. And I, again, I talked with the Filipino team this morning 
and we're starting to get a marketing system set up oh, man I tell you what this is like classic this is even worse than the classic old school shaky paper isn't it prevmedheartrisk.com Louisville uh, November 8 and 9 um, <laughs> Michelle, you know what? You are not the first wife whose uh, husband uh, and cardiologist, whose husband's cardiologist, has said that. They said, "Whatever your whoever your wife's talking to, whatever your wife's telling, listen to her." So I agree with you, Michelle. Thank you for saying that. And here's part of the part of the issue. Whenever I see a patient, he, we know this: uh, men die quicker. From heart attack stroke we just it's a metabolic thing testosterone and some of the other things just make us get inflammatory much quicker so quite often my patients will come in the wife will notice what's going on and the and she will push the husband to get in to see us whenever possible I want the wife to join me for the interaction because exactly what you just said Michelle um, the wife doesn't want the husband to die and you know I'm a man I understand completely men husbands are all about denial so please keep uh, when, ladies I know YouTube may not be uh, as popular with women but uh, we're starting to finally get our messages out to some other other spaces as well we may even start do, doing some Facebook uh, lives but anyway uh, wives please keep pushing your husband uh, we'll try to make the experience as positive as we can for him 55 555 ale 555 here Milan does that mean you're in Milan um, I like you as my teacher well I like you as my uh, student colleague uh, how whatever I like your I appreciate your interest 555 AL 555 Simon Tro if on a low carb keep a keto diet and keeping blood sugar lower than 140 do you reverse the problems you have damaged over the years I N O I V fixed my high blood pressure problem in this diet that's actually a great a great question uh, Simon you know it depends on what the issue is I have seen plaque I have seen three or four years worth of plaque reversed in 18 months kidney disease eye disease you know you will go to the medical literature and most of most docs will tell you once you've got kidney disease you can't reverse it that's not true actually if you go into the research you can uh, even kidney damage and actually I have a patient who has reversed significant kidney damage like uh, what stage stage four kidney disease and pardon the pardon the ugly you know now I'm I really wasn't planning on doing a full YouTube live event but you know we got such a response here uh, anyway I've got a patient that reversed very significant kidney disease. Um, so yes, people start. I mean, people come into me and they and they will tell me that I don't have I don't have any blood sugar problem. I find that not only do they have blood sugar problems, they actually have full blown diabetes, and they didn't know it. And what's worse, their doctor didn't know it. But I've also got patient, and so it sounds like a dire situation. And there's no question, this is the number one cause of heart attack, number one cause of stroke, number one cause of disability, number one cause of death. Uh, for the men, erectile dysfunction, uh, kidney disease, blindness. However, there is a good side to this. And yes, m almost all of these things are reversible, even eye disease and kidney disease. It just takes a lot longer for eye and kidney disease. And uh, it, it, your doctor, doctor will probably want to argue with me about that too and we can get into the uh, the medical science and we can start debating that stuff okay thank you Michelle thanks so much for just appearing uh, uh, totally unannounced like that doc Rob T07 you mentioned testosterone do you have patients on TRT who have a plaque and do you recommend they stay on or get off 
uh, testosterone is a is, is a bigger and comp more complicated issue. So, on the one hand, do I, I get a lot of requests for uh, testosterone treatment? I don't do testosterone treatment for a couple reasons. In most states in the United States, it's considered as a controlled drug, and I have a multi-state practice. Again, I've got 40 state li state licenses. I've got patients all over the world. Uh, Australia, Israel, England, Brazil, New Zealand. And I would just be drawing a target on my forehead if I started doing testosterone therapy. I mean, well, and here's the other thing. If I had a total commitment belief that it was the major thing going on and people needed, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd take those bullets and move ahead. But the vast majority of the problem is not I haven't seen yet in, ter in terms of testosterone. In fact, I was one of those people who originally was very concerned about the risks associated with testosterone. And it gets back to a point that we made earlier where men die earlier of cardiovascular inflammation, cardiovascular disease. Um, so I used to think that way, but and there weren't a lot of good studies. It was sort of like the stem cell issue, sort of like some of the other issues out there, like CIMT, where um, it's new, promising treatment, technology, therapy, but there, it's the Wild West, no, no standards. You know, everybody's just picking what they want to research on it. Now, that, that started to end by a couple of years ago for testosterone. Um, there were some definitive groups of clinical trials. Now, there's just like with so many things, there was a good news, bad news situation with the testosterone cl clinical trials. On the one, the good news was it really did not seem to be the risk that uh, so many people thought earlier. And that's one of the reasons you've seen testosterone therapy just mushroom. It's all over the place now, almost. I mean, it's very common. On the other hand, um, so, no, to answer your specific question, I don't really think that testosterone therapy in and of itself is creating major hazard. So that's the good news side. The bad news side, did they, does it really cure a whole lot, including ED? Eh, a lot of people will think so, just like a lot of people say, you know what, I got a stent and I'm great now. But when you actually put it into blinded, randomized clinical trials, the, um, the testosterone therapy, it, it helped one thing. It helped people sleep. Now here's another wrinkle that makes this whole thing confusing. There are very few things as important to health as sleep. So, you know, if there's something that helps sleep, like testosterone, you would assume that it's going to help a lot of other stuff. But again, uh, uh, in terms of research and, and uh, clinical interpretations, clinical uh, trials, um, I, I think that, that second, those secondary health impacts that you would expect to see with improved sleep just, I think, got washed out. So uh, you probably asked me what time it was, and I started going into how to build a watch. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm sorry, guilty as charged. I do that all the time. Okay, E.T. himself is back. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Steve Mitchum, what about people who have very high testosterone? I don't know how to answer that. I don't work a lot with a lot of people with very high testosterone. Nathan Petty, wife suffered kidney damage due to open heart surgery in 2015, looking for lower protein options for weight loss without much local help so far. Looking forward to CIMT in September. Great. Nathan, does that mean you are in uh, L.A.? Um, you know, here's another interesting thing, guys. I, the reason I happened to just pop on, this was a trial. It obviously wasn't a planned event. It's a trial of this new software that Richard Lund at Lundpick uh, got me set up on. It's very simple. It's Ecamm, Ecamm Live. It's so easy that I thought I was just going through a dry run 
And kaboom, instead of a dry run, I've got people coming up. The reason I'm mentioning that is it also looks like I could even add people to the broadcast. So Rob T07, I just clicked add you to the broadcast. We'll see if you're able to jump in or, or not. And if you don't want to, I totally understand. Um, oh, I think what it's done is it adds your comment to the broadcast. Very good. Okay, so Nathan's 100 miles from L.A. Nathan, mid-September, that's when we should be getting out there, should be getting David out there. And my goal, my plan is to get us out there a couple of weeks later, um, assuming we have some people that are interested in more of a full, uh, a complete evaluation. Uh, Gerard Cook, um, you missed my question, Doc. Okay, Gerard. Uh, you know, I've only got... What about Issel, Isselstein, you mean Esselstein's approach and atherosclerosis? Great question, Gerard. Thank you for your persistence. Somebody was telling me about Esselstein. Oh, actually, David uh, Wright. I was just on the phone with our, our new doc, David, that's, again, taught me a lot of stuff in this space. Really, really good. Um, <laughs> he was quoting Esselstein. He was saying, uh, he heard him once at a presentation that David was giving, and uh, Esselstein made the comment that um, atherosclerosis is a foodborne illness. And he's right. Um, and I'll, let me just say this. There is so much debate, so much anger, frustration, failure to communicate, and confusion between the low-carb crowd, the plant-based versus animal-based, you name it. And if I'm looking like I'm weary from that debate, you can see why. So here's the thing. If you take people that have a BMI of 35, they're eating the standard American diet, hot dogs uh, with buns and milkshakes and a... a a giant coke all that stuff and you put them on excuse me a plant-based diet even if it's got a lot of carbs that is going to make them lose weight and the most important determin uh, determinant for most of these folks especially in the higher BMI categories is to get that BMI down so Isselstein, I'm going to start calling him Isselstein now, Gerard. Uh, Isselstein and a lot of these other plant-based guys have saved tons of people. But uh, you, you, sometimes you have to think a little bit more deeply. And you look at somebody like me, BMI of 21, 20, still insulin resistant, still laying down plaque. What are we going to do? Put me on a plant-based diet? That's not really what's causing the problem. In fact, if I go on, a, if you go back and look at some of my Proline um, videos, I spike up to 180 just eating the soup that's part of the daily Proline diet, and that's a you know that's a 600, six to 800 uh, calories per day diet, and it's because it, and it's it's plant it's all plant-based. It's because uh, those carbs are, are processed and chewed up to where my system's getting hit with all of the, those carbs just right out of the blocks. So the bottom line is Esselstein and all the plant-based guys, uh, they're doing a lot of great work. Uh, to say, though, just totally forget all oils. Don't ever do any time, types of fat, any types of oils and uh, it's all got to be plant-based, etc. It's sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, take a look at one of my videos called Wild Ride. Okay, Andrew, I understand BMI's got a lot of problems, and, and <laughs> I'll just make this one comment. Maybe I'll get time to come back to it. Um, I could say RFM. How many people do you think would understand what I, when I said, no, get your RFM down? Um, so, back to Wild Ride. Um, Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith, 
uh, actually has, uh, consulted with Esselstein. He went to a couple of the Esselstein uh, items, uh, uh, items, events. Pardon me, I'm juggling too many things in my head. Uh, and he actually, I think he was one of the guys that had been on an Esselstein tour a week or two before he came to see me. But here's what happened with Chuck. And he was, the reason it's called Wild Ride is he was driving his Tesla. He had a heart attack. Now, this heart attack happened just a few weeks after he had lost 50 pounds, 5-0, on a vegan diet. He had lost 50 pounds on a vegan diet, and then a few weeks later, he had a heart attack. Obviously, that did not sit well with our friend Chuck Smith, who, again, wild look up Ford Brewer YouTube Wild Ride. Um, I think we've got two versions of it, a short and a long version. So, obviously, Chuck's an engineering type, and I remember meeting him, and I said, look, you've lost... You lost what fifty pounds, and you're why are you you're coming to see me? He said, "Yeah, I want to dial it in." And then he told me the rest of his story. And then he said, "After that heart attack, I really started realizing I need to learn more." And what he did was he looked up, uh, he, he saw on my videos a thing called triglyceride over HDL ratio. That's the thing that, you know, everybody gets, uh, all these docs that are doing just standard run-of-the-mill medicine, uh, not so much prevention-oriented, uh, or, or I'm trying to be politically correct here. I'm not sure exactly how to say it. Anyway, even your standard run-of-the-mill doc will t usually get tr uh, cholesterol panels. And I can go in and look at a cholesterol panel, and for many of you, tell... If your triglycerides over HDL is significantly above one, you probably have insulin resistance going on. Because insulin not only it, it, insulin wants to get sugar out of the blood, so it does two things. Number one, it pushes the sugar into the cells. Number two, and most people don't know this part, insulin will stop you from burning triglycerides. So, if you have a high basal insulin on a long-term basis, your body's not getting much chance to burn triglycerides. And, in addition, if you've got a lot of that going on, you tend to chew up your HDL, which is involved in helping you uh, manage and burn up uh, cholesterol and lipids. So, uh, Chuck, after losing, going, you know, going to see Esselstein, learning to get all of his oils out of his diet, dropping 50 pounds on a pure purely vegan diet and then having his heart attack looked at his uh, triglyceride over HDL and I think he shares in the video it was five so um, by the time he got focused on triglyceride over HDL and carbohydrate metabolism and um, sure enough He's got it down below one now, and he is, uh, he's looking great. He's doing great, and that's the problem. You know, I understand it makes a whole lot of sense. Just, I mean, unfortunately, people, uh, uh, people see fat in the, in the plaque of artery walls, and they assume, well, it's a cholesterol problem. It's a fat problem. Get all the fat out of the diet. That's not the way it works. Um... Now, back to, I don't remember who asked me that a few minutes ago because it was, I was in the middle of talking about something else. But what you said was, BMI is no good. I appreciate you bringing it up, but my, my you know, it's like, why does he always answer a question with a question? I mean, he, that was the next question. I agree, BMI is no good. So should I have said RFM? Anybody know what RFM is? Uh, if you don't, I've got, I've got two or three videos on it. Everybody acknowledges that... Uh, here's what we used to think. We used to think that it was the actual weight of BMI that helped drive this process. But, you know, we found out that that was wrong, too. What we began to find out was that it was the percentage of body fat. The mass in your body and the percentage of 
uh, your body that is made up with fat cells. So if you grow your fat cells, even if you, if you have the same number, if they're getting bigger, they're doing some really bad things. And now we even know what they're doing. They're creating things called um, leptins, adipokines, uh, very bad things, hormone-like chemicals that actually increase cardiovascular inflammation. So, if you go to uh, somebody like, so when they started figuring some of that out in the early days, what, five, ten years ago, they started doing what they called the Schwarzenegger adjustment to BMI. Um, and you, you know, you can probably figure out where that's going. Basically, if you had a, if you got a BMI of 30, but your waist is only 33 or 32, then you've got the Schwarzenegger effect going on. Um, if you, so again, it continued to progress and look it up, look up RFM, relative fat mass, uh, BMI, is it a bad measurement? and my name and YouTube because I've, again I've got like three or four videos on it um, and the the funnels um, actually I think a couple of the pictures on the the thumbnails actually feature Arnold you may uh, you may mistake it for me uh, no you won't um, <clears throat> but it's making the point that uh, it's the body fat. It's not the body weight. So whoever brought up the, the criticism of BMI, great job. I appreciate you doing it. It gave me a chance to do my Arnold in front of everybody. Um, but RFM is, is now a, a, an official title. Unfortunately, I just don't know how well it's going to catch up. Um, RFM is actually involves a thing called, I think it's spec. Uh, with spec, you can get a uh, like cross sections of a leg, a thigh, and see how much of that cross section is fat versus how much of that cross section is muscle. And so when we get all of our act together, at some point we actually will be talking about percentage of body fat or percentage of your body mass that is fat rather than muscle. But you know what? Most of us, eh, I may be wrong. Uh, I, I'll, most of us don't have time to wait for that. We got to take the tools that we're given today and do the best we can for us and our spouses and our uncles and aunts and brothers and sisters. And uh, there we go. Well, again, we're going on, gosh, I don't know how, I, somebody got me to yakking and uh, we're going on over half an hour on a totally unscheduled time. I've actually, um, well, I, I can take time for another couple of questions if you guys uh, are interested. Ice cream man. Oh, ice cream man. 27-year-old taken K2 supplement for seven days, had a fever. Now constant low diastolic pressure between 35 and 50 when I exercise, I get lightheaded and tired. Cardiologist did an echo, nothing found. Any idea? Hmm. No. And if I did, I couldn't tell you because I have to be very careful about practicing medicine over the, uh, over the, so what I try to do is weasel around some words sometimes and say, well, what did you think of X, Y, and Z? My first impression is I don't think it's the, the K2. Um, I, it sounds more like it may be. Number one, you're, you know, for 27-year-old, 27-year-olds uh, typically have significantly low blood pressure, especially diastolic, and especially after a body, uh, after an illness. There, uh, Rob T07, there are scales that will measure body fat. I suppose it's relatively accurate. Well, you know, they used to say that the gold standard for the... Gosh, for over 30 years, they said the gold standard was water uh, weight displacement. Based on the fact of, you know, water uh, density, you know, water, muscles are mostly, muscle tissue is mostly water, um, fat tissue is fat, and fat floats. Um, I've seen several of those. Here's the problem with those. 
air is lighter than either one of them, muscle or fat, and it's very difficult to get somebody to <laughs> exhale all the air to get to where we're a standard, and then keep that exhaled while you you complete the measurement. It's those kind of scales just don't work. Uh, the spec does work, and the bottom line is, you know what? It gets back to an old Arnoldism. Um, Arnold used to Arnold Schwarzeneggerism. He used to, people used to ask him, you know, how do you tell if you're getting fit for a for a uh, a contest? And he said, well, it's very easy, the jump test. Yeah, I'm, my Arnold's not very good. Anyway, the jump test. And here's the, the jump test is incredibly uh, easy. Uh, take your T-shirt off and uh, jump up and down in front of the bathroom mirror. You'll see whether it's up here in obviously your love handles, anywhere else. It's dramatic how much uh, your fat will just bounce up and down. And that's what the, uh, the professional world-class uh, bodybuilders use. There's no technology involved, just and there's no expense, and you don't have to leave the house. You just jump uh, with your shirt off in front of the, in front of the, the, uh, in front of the bathroom mirror. 555, AL555, this is my country. Not sure what that means. Um, I look very professional. I certainly don't feel very professional sitting here in front of my, in the dark. In, well, it looks like the dark to me. I'm trying to get you a little bit of light so I don't look like I'm an FBI interrogator type. Um, and I got run out of my office because our son moved back in with us. So I'm sort of in a, it's not really an attic but it sort of is. You see my Nordic track in the back. I prepared for multiple marathons and, uh, and even an ultra marathon, mostly on that machine. I've been through four of those. And I don't do that kind of distance anymore. We used to think that LSD was the big thing. And I don't mean lysergic acid diethylamide. I mean long, slow distance. I've given up most of the long, slow distance and am doing more of a, a high intensity interval and uh, resistance training. Do that uh, three times a week and I get, you know, I get some, we're, we're in a beautiful place right now, a great place for walking and so I get like ah, three to four, one, one to two mile walks in a day. So I'm getting plenty of walking. Simon Tro. Hey, are you, uh, that's the first time I've seen your picture, Simon. What's your favorite football team in the UK? Now, wait a minute. When you say football in UK, um, I'm in Kentucky. So Kentucky uh, is a big basketball. We, we, we've got more national U.S. championships in college basketball than any, any other team in the, in the world. So, and I'm a big basketball fan. I love basketball. Uh, when you're 5'10", and I, my dad wanted me to be a football player, but I remember my last game, I was in, um, I, I was in, uh, in junior high, ninth grade, and uh, I remember I was the center. I could use, I would center the ball. This is American football, Simon. It's not, it's not that crazy, uh, football that you guys play. Actually, that's, I used to play soccer in uh, what we call soccer in college, but that's a different story, different time. Uh, and you ask, so pardon me for going on maybe too long about personal stories, but my last American football game, I was the center. There was, it was only a dozen and a half on it, of us because we had this really tough, tough um, uh, coach named Jim Fisher. He was like 5'8", yet he'd made it through. Um, he used to, and he had played for, um, I think, Bear Bryant. He had played for the, you know, the big college team at 5'8". So, I mean, this guy was tough as nails. Uh, I was 5'10", and I weighed 115 pounds. So, you know, that's the middle of our offensive and defensive line. <laughs> if you're American, 
You know what that means. That's like a disaster. But usually I was able to get under people and push them. At my last game, uh, the guy across from me, the nose guard for the uh, for our arch rivals, uh, uh, Fair Forest High School, I mean, junior high. I was at uh, Roebuck Junior High. He was, gosh, he was very wide. I found out later he was 100 and, you know, 260 pounds. So he was 30 pounds over twice my weight. And here was the other thing, which I didn't find out until later. He was like a state-level competition uh, lifting champion. But I'll, all I could see was this uh, subcutaneous fat, and I thought, this is going to be great. This guy is way too heavy. I'm going to get underneath and push him all over the place. So first time, hiked the ball, went for him, hit him right, in the, right, right about here, got under him. And the next thing I know, I'm looking up at the sky. I mean, that guy. So I'm not much of an football, American football player. I did play um, uh, UK style uh, football, soccer for uh, Baptist College at Charleston. I doubt anybody's ever heard of the Baptist College of Charleston. Now it's called Charleston Southern University. Uh, I played um, striker. Well, is it striker? Uh, a Pele's position. I wasn't on the wing, and I was the offensive guy. Um, anyway, uh, thank you guys for your patience on my silly stories. Uh, does BMI really mean much at all? It's a really bad measurement. Andrew, that was you. Thank you for bringing that up, and it gave me a chance to get on my soapbox about RFM. So now you guys know. It's not BMI. It's RFM. Um... Um, I just heard my wife come home, uh, and she and I are going to go out to dinner. It's 4.30 um, uh, Eastern Time, where I live here in Lexington, Kentucky. And again, I, uh, I appreciate the, the, the interest, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, now be able to probably do more of these. Thank you so much for your interest. Have a good weekend. Now I don't know how to turn it off. Uh-oh. Huh. Well, here we go. We're done. Thanks. See you guys later.